Good day, everyone. I am Attorney John Destacamento, and this is the second part of a our four-part lecture series in copy reading and headline writing. So the first part, uh, we in the first part we talked about the essence of copy reading as a category, and we also had a review on the fun fundamentals of news writing, a review on the basic principles in news writing, because as we said. The foundation of the skills in copy reading is actually skills in news writing. So for today, I'm going to talk about the style book or the style guide. Now, the style book or the style guide is simply the book or the guide which contains the collection of styles being implemented by the newspaper. So style simply means whether we abbreviate the word or we spell out the word how do we write the numbers should we capitalize uh, words or should we set them in lower case whether we we uh, set the um, set, set an acronym in all caps or or not these things are answered by referring to the style book or style guide now i should point out that Every news organization has its own style book or style guide. We cannot really impose upon a certain news organization or news outfit that, hey, uh, you should have followed this particular style. Because at the end of the day, the, the news organization or newspapering is actually a business in itself. And it is part of the management prerogative of that particular news outfit as to how um, uh, as to what styles it would use in its operations. But as far as the DepEd memo is concerned, particularly in copy reading, the style book or style guide that is to be used is the AP, Associated Press Style Book or Style Guide. So AP or Associated Press is a media organization that is based in the U.S., um, it operates, it has, a, it has many correspondents across the world, scattered across the world. And then newspapers and other news, news organizations worldwide subscribe to the Associated Press um, in order to have access to, to, its, um, to its news. Now, the style book or style guide that I'll be discussing here, or the styles that I'll be discussing here, here are reflective of the style applied in the AP style book or style guide. Okay? So to begin with, let's start with writing the... Okay, sorry. Uh, how do we write the date? How do we write the date in our news article? Now, um, in a newspaper... Usually, okay, so I would like to emphasize that our format here or our medium here is print. That is to say that we always contextualize copy reading within the context of print journalism and not online journalism. So in print journalism, the way that we write our date, our date in our news article is that we don't even really have to, we don't, we don't really have to include or we don't really have to write the specific date like March 10, 2024 or March 18, 2024. We don't really have to write that. As observed in many newspapers, we simply use uh, last Monday afternoon or yesterday afternoon or yesterday or today or, uh, or on Tuesday. We simply write the name of the day. Okay? when that particular news happened. Um, the reason for this is because in a newspaper setup, um, the news that are contained in a newspaper are usually, um, they are really up to date. They're usually, they, these are news that really happened like just today or just yesterday or just two days ago. So it's not really a requirement that we include the specific date on the, or in writing the lead. So we just say on Monday afternoon. But should we write the exact date? Okay, should we write the exact date? We only write the name of the month as well as the specific date. 
And we don't include the year if the year that you will use is uh, it you you it pertains to the current year twenty twenty four. So so instead of saying last October a uh, lot last March let's say eighteen twenty twenty four you just say la last March eighteen and you simply omit twenty twenty four. The reason for this is because again. In newspaper journalism or print journalism, imagine yourself reading a newspaper. Diba? When you read a newspaper, what do you see on top of the page of the newspaper? You see there the masthead or the logo of the of the publication. And beside that, either to the left or to the right, diba? You see the you see the date, the issue date of that newspaper. And the issue date somehow it, it, it gives you the date. At the specific date when it was issued, like let's say for example March 18, 2024. So it would be redundant if the reader would again see 2024 in the news articles that were published in that particular newspaper, considering that as the reader reads the newspaper, he can re readily know that it pertains to the current year 2024 simply by looking at the top of the page of the newspaper. It's there, the issue date. So that's a reason why we don't normally, as a practice, include the year in the dates that we mention in our news article. Aside from that, I would also like to emphasize that the way to write time in our news article, properly write time, is the, the hour is always in figures. So whether it's 0 to 9, um, whether it's 1 to 9, we, we always write them in figure. So 9 a.m., A is small, followed by a period. M is small, followed by a period. It is not 9 capital A, capital M. It is not 9 capital A, period, capital M, period. But it's only 9 space, small a, small, uh, small a, period, small m, period. You don't even have to write um, semicolon zero zero after 9. You omit those. They are irrelevant in so far as um, writing the time is concerned. But of course, if it's 9.30, then you put the semicolon plus 3.0 followed by a space and small a period, small m period after. But I have observed that for most Filipino publications, the way that they write their the, the way that they write their time is that they still use the hour format. So 8 colon 00, zero ng hapon. Pasado alas 8 ng hapon. Maybe it's to show that uh, it's referring to, uh, to, to time. Um, but also the way that they write their dates is noong ikka, it's hyphenated, labing isa ng oktubre. So that's the format. It's not our usual October 11, 2023. So that's the styles for writing date and time. Now let's proceed to writing the address. Okay. So when we write addresses in our news articles, the thing to remember is to uh, maybe the 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 confusing thing there is whether we capitalize the word sitio, the word barangay, the word city, because many publications actually. Uh, especially, especially I have noticed foreign publications, they use uh they 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 lowercase the word city. Okay, but in our case here, the practice is we capitalize the words the the s in sitio, if sitio is followed by the exact name of the sitio, such as sitio bato, and then we also capitalize B in barangay if the word barangay is followed by the exact name of the barangay, barangay ermita and Cebu City. Um, to reduce it into simpler terms, actually, you simply capitalize sitio, barangay, and city if they form part of the official name or the proper name of the City or barangay or city concern, okay. And also the when it comes to writing the word barangay, you really have to spell out the word barangay. Um, but again, this is a matter of style. But I would suggest that you spell out barangay in the body, but in the headline you may just use B R G Y, 
the abbreviated form. Okay? And then what else? I think that's really the most important part. Uh, th th those are just some important notes when it comes to the styles for writing the address. Now, a very basic style in use writing is the style for writing the names. How are we supposed to write names of persons appearing in the news article? And I have he I'm presenting here at least four rules that may govern the use of names in news writing in a news article. So the first rule is upon first mention of the of the name of the person, you must write the complete name followed by the designation or position of that person. So when I say complete name, I'm referring to the first name and the last name only. The complete name does not include the middle initial or the, um, the nickname or alias of the person, okay? So except in crime-related stories where the use of aliases or nicknames may be relevant, in some other in some other usage of um, nickname, other usage of nickname must be avoided um, because the news article is not supposed to be a formal document that should contain all information about that person. So for as long as you have the first name and the last name, that's okay. You don't even have the put to put the middle initial there. Now, after the complete name, it must be followed by the designation or the position of that person or some circumstances pertaining to that person. So designation or position is different from rank or title. Okay. Designation or position is some it, it pertains to the the position being held by that person with in, in an official capacity. Rank or title are usually these are these are not positions they are titles say for example police officer one police officer two fire officer one fire officer two father for a priest attorney for a lawyer um these are positions or titles okay on the other hand designations or positions such as as you can see on the screen, Police Officer 1 Julio Samonte, comma, Investigator at Mandawi City Police Office. So the words Investigator at Mandawi City Police Office is the designation or position of Police Officer 1 Julio Samonte. And again, this is the way how it's supposed to be written. First, you write the complete name during the first mention, followed by the designation or position of that person. But if that person has a title or rank, such as police officer one, that title or rank must always must always precede precede the first uh, the full name, the complete name. Okay. The second rule is upon first mention. You first write the position in the government followed by the complete name. And what are these common positions in the government that must be written first before the complete name of the person? President, vice president, senator, secretary, uh, cab secretary of cabinet position uh, of the cabinet, such as DILG secretary, DepEd secretary. Um, you write that position in the government first before the complete name. Uh, what else? Um, senator representative. We don't we don't say congressman or congresswoman. Huh? We we write um, um, Laguna first district rep or representative. It's not congressman or congresswoman. We can use congressman or congresswoman in some other usage, but um, as far as the official position or title is concerned, we use rep or representative. Um, because they're members of the House of Representatives. And then other positions that can be written before the complete name is, are um, governor, vice governor, provincial board member. Um, what else? You have um, mayor, vice mayor, city councilor, municipal mayor. You have barangay captain and barangay councilor. So if you notice, most elective positions in the government, they are usually stated or written first before the full name of the person occupying that position. And since you wrote them first before the name, and be because we are writing them first before the name, 
usually these positions are capitalized. Okay? But you only capitalize these positions if the person hold, hold, holds such position, such a position in an incumbent capacity. Meaning to say, if the person is still is still the mayor, if the person is still the president, if the if the person is still serving as a senator, his or her term as senator, as as of the time the news article was written, then we capitalized the the position or the title if on the other hand the person is no longer serving that position in an incumbent capacity meaning former president former senator former dilg secretary we no longer capitalize such positions instead we set them in lower case okay so the only time that we capitalize president senator governor etc is when they are serving that positions in an in in an incumbent capacity meaning if they are still incumbent officials the third rule is somehow an exception to the second rule here if the government position is not common earlier we mentioned about president vice president these are very common government positions so we we write them before the first name but if the government position is uncommon or very lengthy too long to write such as, for example, head of the Municipal Agriculture Office of Balamban. So it's it's quite a mouthful. So we go back to rule number one, where first uh, we first write the full name of the person, let's say Jerome Gonzalez, comma, head of the Municipal Agriculture Office of Balamban. So even if it's a government position, but since the government position is quite lengthy, then we write it in um we write it in uh we write it after the full name of the person rule number 4 during subsequent in subsequent mentions of the of the names of those person we simply use their last name so we say samonte said we say marco said we say aquino said we say garcia said or if it's too much na in the news article you keep on repeating their last name you can also simply use just their uh, pronouns he said she said or it said if you can also use it said if you're pertaining to a government agency uh, say for example um, the pag-asa you can say it said or you can say the state weather bureau said okay or you can simply say pag-asa said okay but um in all other uh, during first mention the name of the person must be uh, it must be written completely, first and last name. So those are the rules or those are the styles for writing names that appear in the news article. How about what how about the styles for writing acronyms appearing in the in the in the news article? Okay, so for acronyms, okay, the first time that we mention the government agency or the specific the specific um, words pertaining to that acronym, you really have to spell out the government agency. So you really have to say the Department of Education followed by open close parenthesis DEPED released a new set of guidelines dot 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 or the Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical Astronomical Services Administration for Pag-asa. So you really have to spell out the name of the government agency during the first mention and after spelling that out it must be followed by the acronym enclosed in parentheses now sir how do we write the acronyms do we like do we like um capitalize them or all, put them in all caps or do we simply just capitalize the first letter what's what's really the rule sir okay so here's the rule for Three letter acronyms, two to three letter acronyms, DA for example, BIR, PNP, NBI, FBI, um, what else? Um, and all other three letter acronyms, okay? TIN for tax identification number. So we always um we always set them in all caps. They're always in all caps. But for acronyms in four letters and more okay the rule is different if the acronym is four letters or more we first determine whether the acronym could be read meaning to say can it be read as a word 
Say for example, pag-asa. Can we read? Can we read pag-asa as a word? Yes, we could read. Komelek. Can we read pag komelek as a word? Yes, we could. We could. We can read komelek as a word. DSPC. It's four letters, but can we read it as a word? No, we cannot. So the rule, if the acronym could be read as a word, is that you simply capitalize the first letter. All the rest are written in small letters. So the way to write Comelec is you, you simply capitalize the first C and all the other letters are written in small letters. Pag-asa, the same. You simply capitalize P in pag-asa. COVID-19, therefore, you simply capitalize C. All the rest are in small letters because you can read COVID. ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It can be read as a word. So you simply capitalize A. But for all other acronyms that, that cannot be read as a word, the SPC or uh, RSPC and SPC or let's say DILG, DNR, you cannot really uh, you cannot really read them. Or let's say in your article you have you're introducing an acronym of a of a homeowners association. Let's say Santo Nino Village Homeowners Association. Santo Nino S N V H O. Okay. So that's S N V H O is something that cannot be read. So you really have to set that acronym in all caps. Okay, so that's the rule. And then for subsequent mention, you may use just the acronym only or the pronouns for that government agency. But in the headline, you always use acronym. If the acronym, of course, is a popular acronym. You always think about your audience, whether your audience is familiar with that acronym. Because if they are familiar with that acronym, it's okay for you to use that acronym in the headline. But if they are not, then you just simply use the a generic term for that acronym. So instead of Santo Nino Village Homeowners Association, maybe you can use the words homeowners group in the headline instead of SNVHO because no no because your audience, your readers may not not all your readers may not know what SNVHO stands for. So that's the rule in writing acronyms in our news articles. Next. Okay. So styles for writing punctuation marks. Okay. So first First things first, the comma, okay, if, if you want to use a direct quote in your uh, news article, okay, the comma should be enclosed in the quotation marks, in the close quotation marks. So it should come before the close quotation mark. And um, take note that if you use a direct quote, there is only one period there, there. Okay, I mean, there is only one period if, of course, the direct quote is only one sentence. Um, but if the direct quote consists of three sentences, so first sent, uh, let's say there, there's a three sentence direct quote. So the first sentence of the direct quote, period. The second sentence of the direct quote, quote another period. The third sentence of that direct quote, there's no, it, it's not going to be a period, but a comma before you close it with a closing quotation mark. And then followed by the attribution, Marco said. And then after the attribution, that's the time that you put the period at the end of that sentence. But always, always, the comma in direct quotations must always be inside the quotation marks. Okay? So take note of that. Same thing with question marks inside direct quotation. So if the speaker is asking a question or if the speaker or the source asked a question and you want that question quoted exactly in your news article then you you put the question mark inside the quotation mark and there's no need for you to add a comma after the question mark okay now um because we're mentioning here about direct quotes and um i i remember i did not discuss um direct quotes earlier uh in in part in the part one of this lecture so just a little a little bit of back um backtracking to our lesson on one sentence one paragraph diba i said that it's important in use writing to to use as a general rule one sentence one paragraph where the the sentence regardless of its length 
okay, is set as one paragraph in itself. So that's a general rule. And for every general rule, there is, there is or there are always exceptions. So what are the exceptions to the one sentence, one paragraph rule? Meaning to say, what are the instances where it's okay that your paragraph may contain two sentences or more? So the first exception to the one sentence, one paragraph rule is when the second sentence is too short. If the second sentence is too short, it's okay to put that sentence as part of the first sentence and to put those two sentences under one paragraph. Second is when the second sentence is too related, intimately connected with the first sentence. So if the second sentence is very, very much related to the first sentence, the idea expressed in the first sentence, it's okay in order to like, in order not to interrupt the flow of thought in that particular paragraph, it's okay that you join the second paragraph with the first paragraph under one. I mean, it's okay to join the second sentence with the first sentence under one and the same paragraph. So, for example, an example to this is um, when it comes to writing obituary stories, stories about deaths of uh, a, a certain uh, death of prominent individuals. So, say, for example, veteran Filipino actress Jacqueline Jose died of heart attack this morning in her house in Quezon City, period. She was 59. Okay, she was 59 is, sim is three words, right? So it's very short. And she was 59 is also very intimately connected to the first to the idea expressed in the first sentence. She was 59. By the way, the 59 there pertains to the age of Miss Jacqueline Jose. And the way to write editorial uh, obituary stories is that the the age I I, I really don't uh, I'm not sure if it, that's a convention or standard, but I I always like real I have really observed that that's just the the way to present the age of a prominent person dying. She was 50, she was 59, he was 78, he was 84. And it's always written immediately after the first sentence. So maybe because the second sentence is intimately connected with the first sentence. And as, as I've said, that is one of the exceptions to the one sentence, one paragraph rule, where we are allowed that the second sentence can be joined with the first sentence in one and the same paragraph. And then finally, number three, um, number three, the third exception to the one sentence, one paragraph rule is this, the use of direct quotes. Okay, when you quote your sources, of course, um, most news articles are, are based from an interview with sources, with persons, with officials. And these officials, they don't just tell you one sentence responses when you ask them a question. Chances are they they would normally blabber and give you kilometric responses even if you're only asking them one question. So if you would like to quote them, directly quote them in your news article, um, it's okay that you can write more than one sentence as a direct quote. So maybe you will write two sentences worth of direct quotes. You can put that in one and the same paragraph. Or if you want to use three sentences worth of direct quotes, it's okay also. You can also, you can also put that in one and the same paragraph. Because again, we don't want to interrupt the flow of thought in the direct quote. Okay, but... Of course, make sure also that your direct quote is your direct quotation is not like it, it's not five, six, or seven sentences worth of direct quotation because that would be very also heavy on the eyes as well. So maybe two to three to actually maybe maximum of four, four sentences worth of direct quotes in one paragraph would 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 actually be typical. But two to three, maybe is really typical. Okay, but that is not to say. But that, that is not to say that uh, you cannot use um, just one sentence direct quotes. Huh? Uh, what I'm trying to say is you can use one sentence direct quotes. You can also use two sentences, three sentences worth of direct quotes and put it in the same paragraph as an exception to the one sentence, 
one paragraph rule. Now, what's the next? Okay, I think, okay. Styles for writing numbers. This is very basic. So, uh, numbers often are written in our, in a news article. I think most news article really involve writing really involve numbers so if the number if the if the sentence begins with a number always capitalize that number so 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 we say 50 teachers joined the training so 50 must be spelled out okay um did i say capitalize i I, what I meant was uh, to spell out the number if the, if the sentence begins with the number. If the number appears in the headline, always use or always write that number in figures. In figures, because in the headline, remember the, the, the idea that copy reading, copy reading um, is, is a contest um, the context for copy reading is newspaper or print journalism. And um, in print journalism, we're very much particular with the space limitations. So in the headline, we want to maximize the space. And that is why we write the numbers in figures always, always, always in the headlines. Yes, I am aware that some newspapers may be using um, some, maybe spelling out numbers in their headlines i've seen newspapers do that but it's more of like it's more of um i think the their reason for doing that is because um it's because it would be awkward for the space allotted if they will not spell that out but because because the headline is too short but really the rule in headline writing is always write the numbers in figures. Now, rule number three, if, if the number is a percentage or an amount of money or dates or age or let's say grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, and so on, you, um, what else? Um, an address, block, block four, lot four, block one, lot one, okay? In these cases, you always write these numbers in figures. And then finally, rule number four, which is the most common rule in writing the numbers, if the numbers, if the number is written in the middle of the sentence, the rule would depend on whether or not the number falls from zero to nine or ten up. Because if the number falls from zero to nine, then you have to spell out that number. And if the number, on the other hand, is 10 and above, then you have to write it in figures. So let's have a quick exercise here. Number one, more than 20 teachers joined the training. So the number 20 here appears in the middle of the sentence. So we use rule number four. And 20 is 10 up. So, so therefore, we should encircle the word 20 because the proper... The proper style there is to write 20 in figures. Number two, 20 teachers joined the training, two zero teachers. So since the sentence begins with a number, then we have to spell out that number. And in order to spell out that number, the symbol to use is simply the um, insert, you, you, you simply encircle 20. Number three, nine girls and 15 boys qualified to the tournament. So nine girls, that's correct. That's correctly written ang nine because um, the, the sentence starts with a number. So any number for that matter must be spelled out. On the other hand, 15 boys, 15 is 10 up. And it, so it should have been, um, it should have been written in figures. Number four, he was born on June 6, 2005. Six here is written in, in, in words, but it should have been written in figures because it's an exception to the rule. It's rule according to our rule number three. Uh, percentage, amount of money, dates, always written in figures. And then number five, inflation rose by 9%. Again, nine must be uh, spelled out. I mean, nine must be in figures because it's a percentage. So that's the answer key. You encircle those items in order to properly reflect their style. Now, other styles to observe, date line. When it comes to dateline, so what is this dateline? Dateline is also sometimes called the place line. 
Dateline is simply the name of the place where the news writer wrote the uh, news article. Okay, it should not be confused with the place where the news story happened. Dateline is not necessarily the place where the news where the where the news took place or where the event discussed in the news took place. So it's possible that the event actually or the news subject the subject of the news actually happened, let's say, in Cebu City. But if the news writer wrote the news article in Manila, then the proper dateline there is really Manila, Manila, Philippines, and not Cebu City. Because again, dateline or place line pertains to the place where the news writer wrote the story and not necessarily where the, the event that is subject of the news happened. But of course, in some cases, the event the 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 writer may have written the news where the where the where the news took place. Let's say, for example, you're covering the Palarong Pambansa in Cebu City because Palarong Pambansa will be held in Cebu City. So usually, um, since you are covering the event in Cebu City, then you just place Cebu City, Philippines there as your dateline because you are writing the story from Cebu City as well because you're covering the event in Cebu City also. Okay, so that's dateline or place line. And the way to write dateline or place line is usually all caps, ang name sa city, and Philippines is in um down style format. So that's usually the term. And then it is followed by an dash, either M dash or N dash. It's it doesn't really matter. Both are correct. But sometimes um it may also be followed not by a dash, but um but a colon. But the use of colon in dateline is more of like it's rare, but it's still acceptable. But the most commonly used um symbol or the most commonly used punctuation is the dash whether it's an n or an m dash that's for dateline and then subheads or subtitles these subheads or subtitles these are the words or group of words or phrases that you see in between paragraphs you see there are some very lengthy news articles and news writers or copy editors they use subheads or subtitles to compartmentalize the ideas expressed in the paragraphs just to make sure or uh, as a way of like um, logically presenting the news story so do not confuse subhead or subtitle with the headline the headline is really the title of the news article that appears on top of the entire news story but the subhead or subtitle is just two words one word or just a phrase found in the middle of paragraphs just to and then after that let's say for example um in our discussion from the first lecture about confidential fund diba you and you interviewed three people you interviewed sara duterte you interviewed risa Teveros, and you interviewed bongbong marcos so before you transition to the part where risa Teveros now gives out his or uh, her comment about the proposal of vp sara then maybe you can insert a subhead or subtitle that goes um on the veros slams Duterte's proposal. Okay, so it's like a subhead or subtitle that can be found before you discuss Ponteveros's part of the news article. And then before the part where you present Marcos's uh, the information pertaining to Marcos, you can also write um you can also write Marcos Bax Sara. Okay. So these are subheads or subtitles. And again they are different from the headline. The headline is um, VP Sara or um, or Duterte seeks 250M in confidential fund. That's really the headline. Subheads or subtitles, they are found in the middle of paragraphs. Now, so I think that's the styles, the important styles that are applicable to copy reading and headline writing. And in the next lecture, we'll be talking about the symbols used in copy reading and headline writing. That's it for now. Good day and see you in the next video.